What is happening, everyone? I'm extremely excited to be here with all of you. We had a chance to kind of vibe out earlier and, and, and really just get to know each other a little more. But the, most, the thing I'm most excited about, this is Mental Health Awareness Month. At the YMCA, this is our second year of putting energy into a campaign to one, let the community know about the issues of mental health, specifically youth experiencing mental health. Two, to let the community know that we are doing something about it as an organization. And three, to inspire those around us to take their mental health serious and to make it a priority. So with us today is the experts. You all are doing it on a day-to-day -day basis. You have loads of experience, loads of wisdom, and you've been doing the work in a way that I feel is best meeting our community. My hope today is to be able to talk a little bit more about what this youth mental health crisis is, and then to drop in a little bit more about your perspective and what you're seeing. So with that being said, um, Deanna, my friend, tell me a little bit from who you are, what you do, and what is this youth mental health crisis we're hearing about? Thanks, Justin. Uh, my name's Deanna. I am a um, program director here at the YMCA. I oversee our school-based mental health programs. Um, day to day, I oversee multiple school-based programs, um, as well as just supporting our clinicians and our case managers and supporting our youth. Um, here at the YMCA, we have about eight different mental health therapy programs in general. Okay. Um, three of those which are school-based, um, six which are focused specifically on youth. Um, so I have some of our clinicians and our case managers here with me today, um, and we'll just be reviewing the mental health um, that we're experiencing in our, in our communities, in our schools. Uh, I would say the biggest thing that we've noticed since actually pre-COVID is an influx of youth just being identified as having mental health issues. And that could be as minor as, you know, family transitions, divorces, up to extreme community violence that they're experiencing and, you know, PTSD and just um, a lot of issues that stem in the family but are being seen in our schools, um, which bring them to our attention. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, consensus is is what we're hearing on the national level with the nation experiencing youth mental health crisis. Would you all thumbs up and say yes? In fact, you all are seeing that as well, and that's accurate. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, Indiana, you shared a little bit about some of the kind of the scale of issues that you know that a youngster might be facing. But let me, let me hear from you all. Like, what what do you see on a day to day basis with with the clients that you serve? Um, a lot of what I'm seeing is um, just an adjustment after the pandemic. I've uh, definitely, anytime I have a client come in, uh, most of the time they're coming in saying, yeah, I noticed a shift in my anxiety, in my depression, in my you know relationship with my parents after, or yeah, after the pandemic hit. Um, so it definitely took a big toll on a lot of um, communities. Um, yeah. Okay. I would say like the other thing that I'm noticing more is that because of the pandemic, a lot of kids have been online a lot more. So there's been a lot more information, whether it's good information, misinformation, right. but I think kids now have better vernacular to talk about what they're experiencing and how they're experiencing it, whether it's questions about gender identity, sexuality, neurodivergency, all these things. But I'm noticing that a lot more kids who are really into therapy or seeking therapeutic resources are able to tell me, look, I think I have ADHD, I think I have autism, like all these different things, right. you know. So there is that positive within that along with these kiddos who are having struggles to adjust going back to in person. That's so insightful. I'll tell you, I have an eight-year-old son and a 12-year-old daughter. My 12-year-old's in sixth grade, and we've been having conversations, fluid conversations about mental health, um, about what she observes, what she sees. And you're right, her vernacular and ability to describe is is amazing. When I look at myself growing up, we didn't have, we, we just had like common terms, like I'm crazy, right? Or, or, or I'm experiencing depression, but we didn't really know what that was. So I like to hear that there is some positive coming from this, and it's through that education. Tell, tell me about the families, because you're working with youth, but what are you seeing from a, a family perspective? I think first and foremost with the families, they recognize that their youth can use support within the mental health and, uh, field, but they just don't know how to support due to the lack of potential knowledge or experience or awareness of it. So I think that's where we step in and in providing insights and perspective of normalization, first and foremost, and various things or techniques and resources that we could offer here internally in the YMCA and then externally. And just kind of experimenting with, hey, try this out. Hey, try this out. You know, just in, in providing feedback and having that relationship has been very positive uh, on behalf of our youth. Milo, you strike me. Um, well, I already know this. So you're a youngster, great energy, great passion. But I, I, I bet um, having a younger male 
being able to other younger males to be able to see. I bet that that opens up conversations and opens up opportunity. What are some of the things you do to build a, a rapport with, with some youngsters? Yeah, so first and foremost, uh, the male uh, presence in an individual's life has been very influential. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, many of the youth that I, I work with, we do fist bumps, right? And it's just that male-male uh, interaction, it, it's a, a boost in their confidence. Yeah. Uh, one of the first activities I do with every youth that I interact with is a positive affirmation board, right? So prior to having an understanding of the friendships, the families, relationships you wanna have, um, presently in school and then outside of school, we need to know how, who we are as individuals. So it's having an understanding of self-identity, of positive characteristics that you could uh, have a foundation on. So I, I've seen a shift in youth coming in shy, intimidated, kind of those terminologies to the point of uh, them being confident to say, hey, I'm strong, I'm determined. And it's a confidence boost. Um, and one thing that due to the pandemics, the social interaction has had a, a negative impact on our youth where they don't know what kind of friends they want, right. uh, the, the relationships with, between parents. So having that normalization of saying, hey, let's talk about friendship. Let's talk about healthy boundaries between the parents and the kid, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that is a shift that we are empowering our youth to take control of what they want in their oh, I love that. That gets me excited. Again, as a father, it gets me excited to know that my children can have an influence that allows them to, to seize their voice yeah. and, and be able to share their life. So I, I, I love that. Dave, let me ask you a question. When, when, you know, when I think of community mental health, you know, the term community can be overlapping and it can just kind of be like the San Diego community, right? Okay. But from your view, especially since you have some Los Angeles and Long Beach under your belt, you know, here in San Diego, what are things that you're seeing to the San Diego community that, that might feel unique to this area? So the biggest difference I've seen with San Diego is even though San Diego is small, the freeways really separate yeah. our access. Yeah. It's a really big difference from South San Diego to Mid San Diego to even Northern San Diego, which relates to the accessibility. Uh, um, even with funding and, distri and distributing funds like to certain neighborhoods, sometimes the quantitative research and data overlooks the qualitative that we need to service what we need. So instead of doing research of what's actually needed, we're putting services in place without actually making them reflect what's really needed. And that's where the community comes in. Okay. Because it can be a community racially, mm -hmm. a community financially, mm -hmm. a community um, I, like identity-wise, which you identify as can be a community. Yeah. And all those different communities have different needs. Yeah. So yeah. it's one thing to have services and put them places, but are these services reflecting? Right. If they're not reflecting, they're not helping. Right. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. I love that. And then when you think of accessibility, I think we all know that for for some groups, services of any kind are easily accessible. For our other groups or our marginalized communities, there's a variety of issues that are going on. And when I was speaking with you, Deanna, earlier about just how we look at the TIES program and how it provides access to these opportunities. Tell me just some basic facts, like how many young people we serve a year roughly, what communities are we in? Yeah, so in any given year, we roughly serve about 110 plus students um, in a year. Our populations predominantly focus on um, low um, economic uh, status families, so those who have Medi-Cal or no insurance. Okay. Um, a lot of, so we serve um, 13 schools within San Diego Unified specifically for tides. Um, our services are mainly in the Southeast area. Um, we have one that's in the Ocean Beach area, one that's off by San Diego State, but the majority are between downtown the 94 um, freeway. Um, we serve elementary, middle school, and high school students, um, really looking at meeting the kids where they're at. Our services are at the school site, so okay. increasing the accessibility yes. for our families and then providing family services if they're open to it mm -hmm. and you know agree to the service for that. And then we have our case managers who support the families with any type of resources they need, whether that's housing, child care, getting access to the YMCA and our activities, um, just any type of support that they need. Uh, so we really try to do some wrap services there. Um, and what's unique about TIDES compared to our other um, two school-based programs is that we have psychiatry services. Okay. So we actually have a psychiatrist on site um, who provides a second opinion. It could be a refill for your ADHD medication. Um, so we do have those services as well. I love it. I love it. You know, I've, I've always said to me, tithes and our school-based programs are doing the most impactful work on a day-to-day basis. Any given day, we know that you and your teams are providing hope, providing opportunity, providing a listening ear, validation, providing all the things that are necessary for, for our, our youth. So I'm yeah, very and, grateful. And we've gotten feedback from kids where they've told us, well, 
I'm only gonna go to school because my therapist is gonna see me today. Wow. And that's across all three of our school-based wow. programs. We have kids who have, they're not going to school consistently, that tends to be a main referral, okay. which leads into other issues right. that are happening in the home and in their community. Um, but we have a few kids who specifically say, well, what day are you gonna see? Okay. Because that's the day I'm gonna go to school. Yeah. Uh, so our therapists build these relationships with our clients uh, they become a form of support um, to build them up and then be able to have these conversations with their families, have these conversations with their teachers, um, and advocate for themselves and what they need. I love that. We were speaking earlier, Bianca, about just the, the, the power that you all have in building a trusting relationship. What, what's, what's the secret? What's the secret sauce? <laughs> secret sauce? Um, I think for me, you know, I will explain, you know, what therapy is, but I think it's mostly giving like just that listening ear. At that point, like when I'm trying to build rapport and get these families in who are really struggling with the idea of therapy, my plan, if you will, is, or my secret sauce, is to just lend that listening ear and just to reflect what their concerns are. Even if that means that they don't necessarily buy into therapy, I'm like, yo, I get it. Talking about feelings is hard. It's hard for me even as a therapist. I'm right. being really real. And even though I'm the expert, you know, just admitting that I'm also human too. And coming alongside them and really highlighting that it's okay to be human. Yeah. You know, whether you're a parent, your kid, whatever. God, that must feel amazing to be a youngster and to be validated and say, you are fine just the way you are. I'm gonna sit here and listen, I'm gonna understand, I'm share that I have commonality, right? That's just such a powerful thing. Um, and so I, I think that to me is what brings all this beauty to this program is that you all are experts on developing trusting relationships. At the end of the day, you develop trust, you walk alongside these youngsters and their families, right? If their families are into it, um, you know, and that's just a great thing. So I'm a parent, again, I have a 12 year old and a, and a six, eight year old. Tell me, what, what can I do? What, what's, some, what's some simple things I should be aware of as a parent in helping my youngsters navigate life? <laughs> What's the um, secret? I don't know. That's, there's some things I want to follow up from for this whole conversation. When you started saying, like, what are we seeing in schools with mental health? I'm seeing anxiety. Ooh. I'm seeing depression. I'm seeing isolation. Okay. Loneliness. Okay. You know, all, I think, we're important prior to the prior to COVID-19 pandemic, but now after, yeah. you know, um, it's exacerbated. It, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's still in the forefront. And, um, you talk about like bringing the families in. What I'm seeing, I'm gonna be real. I'm seeing disconnect. Okay. I'm seeing extreme disconnect from the families. From the, the families to the youth, okay. the families to the school system. Okay. I don't know if it's. I mean, it's a, it's a, 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 like a lot of different things. It's financial. It's you know parents having their own mental health. Mm. But we need. So you said with you as a parent support. Please. Listen, I showed up today because I was talking to my clinical supervisor yesterday about you know me as a as a, a therapist with these kids. What I'm seeing is that the parents are not able to understand mm -hmm. and no matter where you are cognitively as a parent being able to show up and even just listen yeah. you know that is just the easiest step show up if you're getting invited to school if you're getting invited to birth to you know give resources to your your child that you know is needing help show up sure. cognitively you might not be able to administer you know we can plan interventions totally. and involve them but cognitively just listening and being able to partner with what's available. And I want to add to that because I know that showing up can be, just like you're saying, like when you have parents that are working, trying to, you know, struggling to make ends meet, they're single parent households. Um, I think showing up can look differently. Yes. It doesn't have to be physically being yes. there on the campus, exactly. emailing, you know, the therapist, emailing the teacher, calling. Um, just, I know some teachers are even comfortable with texting, you know, mm -hmm. like, <clears throat> and then also kind of on the other end of that, being open to texting and meeting, meeting families where they're at a lot of families just aren't in the headspace to be able to take a phone call or oh. you know like i said physically be there so you know, just being open to the different ways that you can approach communication um i think is really important too that's part of my secret sauce yeah. Yeah. Flexibility. Flexibility. Yeah. 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 And, and, and i would like to show up part yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 we're part of working for the ymca yeah. Yeah. we have the ability to be flexible yeah. we have exactly. to be innovative in different ways yeah. where it's not so structured where you have to do it like this yeah. so like right. yeah. said, we can use different ways like we can schedule things on text messages mm -hmm. and we can do part of on a phone call part you know different things we can even meet parents like there's different ways yeah. to support parents right. and one of the things i want to highlight that you said is like listening but it's like the 
type of listening that we're doing. A lot of the times people don't do this on purpose, but you're listening, but you're listening to respond and you're not listening to take in information. And when you're trying to make kids finish sentences real quick and they're trying to explain how they feel, they are frustrated and they shut down. So another real open-ended question is, how can I help? Yeah. What do you need? Yeah. And if they don't know, I will be here with you until we figure it out. You know, like yeah. and giving them options to start that, you know, and not getting frustrated. And I think that's really hard for parents because of the pandemic, you're going back in and you're re-entering the rat race, yes. so to speak, and trying to catch up on all these things. Yes. And kids are getting left behind accidentally. Yes, yes. Yeah. I feel super convicted and feel like I need to be a better father. <laughs> <laughs> I need to show more, I need to email the teacher back. <laughs> Any other kind of like tidbits of, of things that you would advise parents or caregivers or anyone that's really wanting to do their best for, for that youngster? I don't know. For me, I've just really been on this fan of like emotional health. We're talking about mental health, but yeah. emotional health. Mm -hmm. I'm always telling all my clients, it's like, it's okay to feel how you feel when you feel it. Mm -hmm. In society, we're like plagued with no negative emotions. Say that one so, more time. It's okay to feel how you feel, feel when you feel it. I say that all the time. Yeah, you need because a clothing line. It, oh, yeah. <laughs> no, because in society, if you're mad, if you're sad, if you show up with a bad mood, like you come to a meeting with a bad mood, ooh, yeah. don't come back. Right. But those, that's why those emotions exist. Yeah. If someone made me mad, I'm upset. Yes. So, you know, being able to let your kids come to you with that. I had a really bad day at school. I'm upset right now. I'm very sad without dismissing their emotions and making you feel like they're not going to be heard or discounted, which creates more isolation and more anxiety because you have to feel like you need to feel, you feel happier, feel joy or, Absolutely. you know, pleasant. And sometimes it's just not the case. And then the message is you do that when they're little and then you get parents who are frustrated when their teens don't talk to them. Absolutely. And they're like, well, they don't tell me about my day. They're, my day's fine. My day's this. Well, what did you do? With, what did you do to set up that yeah. you know trend? Mm -hmm. You yes. make it feel like their feelings can be talked to. That it's okay to feel what you feel, how you feel it. Or did you tell them that you didn't have enough time with that? Being like, you know what, I had a hard day too. We can't talk about that right now because I'm a parent. Yeah, That's, it's it's so interesting, right? Being a parent, it's all of those little moments with with your kids, right? That. You know, there's the conscious moments when you're, you're being a good parent. There's the unconscious moments when you have life and you're flooding. You're like, yeah, 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 right? But what I'm hearing is it's imperative to be dialed into those little moments, those little communication opportunities, those little engagement opportunities, because that is really setting the tone for the dynamic of the relationship going forward. And if, in fact, you're encountering issues, mental health, whatever it might be, that better sets a parent up to be an ally and a partner to, to that youngster. Yeah. yeah. And I want to reiterate, it's okay for parents to take breaks to say that, yes. you know, I can't hear this right now, but can we talk in 15 minutes when I've had a second? It's coming back to that kiddo that is so important. You know, you can put a pause on things. So that shows and models really good boundaries with emotions, right? Yes. I can feel what I'm feeling and I want time for you. I have time for you. I just need to yeah. have a second to myself because I want to acknowledge that our parents are holding a lot, you yeah. know. Yeah, as a worker, as a parent, as a wife, as a partner, whatever their roles are, yeah. you know, they're holding all that too. And it's not fair to just say, well, the parent has to do this. Mm -hmm. The parent is also human and needs to take time for themselves. Come back around though, because that come back around makes a really big difference. I love it. I love it. I think also the normalization of it's a relationship, right? It's the parent and the kid. You guys are a team, right? And when there's a, a disagreement or disconnect, how can we maintain or reconnect those two yeah. individuals, right? And having that conversation of, hey, this is how I need support and vice versa, right? It's hand in hand. We're, we're in different times right now yeah. with the various outlets of social media, society, and, and the pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. The pandemic has done a lot. So having that, hey, we're a team, let's tag team this together, whether that's sitting down and checking in or having a, a code word for, hey, I need my space, right? Mm -hmm. Having that understanding it's a relationship and whenever there's this disconnect, that's okay, but let's get reconnected. Uh, on the same foundation. Oh, I love that. I love the mentality of looking at the dynamic as a team. Um, I, I think I grew up in an environment where it wasn't a team. It was do what I say. Mm -hmm. yes. It was. It was. The, there was no sharing of power, mm -hmm. right? And. Um, and that was just my generation, maybe yours as well. But to know to know now that we're normalizing the fact that parents are part of that team, yeah. and that parents uh, are guardians or, or caretakers have such an influential role on how they share power and how they uplift and give voice to that youngster. And then I kind of feel like that makes me confident knowing that by doing those elements, those things, you're better setting that youngster to be successful in whatever endeavor it is, whether it's therapy, whether it's sports, whatever it might be. You all are. 
<laughs> I love therapists. I want to get that's the next year, right? I heart therapist. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, to close this out, anything else you like to you like to throw in the mixer before? Um, no, I mean I would just like to share my great appreciation for my staff that I have, our therapists. Um, we have about 12 therapists that currently work for us that we serve over 26 schools just in our school-based programs. Um, so we're doing a lot. You guys are doing a lot and you guys don't go unseen to me. So I appreciate you guys and our group managers. <laughs> yes, yes. I, I also would say it goes hand in hand of similar to having a community of support for the youth, but also within mental health, we need community support partnerships. We can't do this alone. We're in this together, so let's collaborate let's partner together to offer what's best for our youth and our next generation that's coming up because they need it. I dig that, brother. And there's nothing better than ending something with a call to action. And my hearing you as a call to action is knowing that if you're out in the community and you're wanting to have impact in this area, connect with us. We can let you know how you can join the team, Definitely. share some resources, share some, some wisdom, whatever. Thank you all.